Hello. In 1840, a young Danish girl called Regine Olsen got engaged to her sweetheart, a difficult and brilliant young man called Soren Kierkegaard. The two were much in love, but soon Kierkegaard began to have doubts. He worried that he couldn't love Regine and stay true to himself and his philosophy. It was a dilemma, and Kierkegaard broke off the engagement, a decision from which neither he nor his fiancée fully recovered. This unhappy episode has become emblematic of the life and thought of Soren Kierkegaard, a philosopher who confronted the painful choices in life in the light of his philosophy and endured dark times perhaps as a consequence. Yet Kierkegaard is much more than the gloomy Lutheran Dane of reputation. A thinker of wit and elegance, his ability to live with paradox, his admiration for both Socrates and Christ, his hatred of Hegel, and his desire to think about individuals as free have given him great purchase in the modern world and is known as the father of existentialism. With me to discuss Soren Kierkegaard are John Lippitt, Professor of Ethics and Philosophy of Religion at the University of Hertfordshire, Claire Carlyle, Lecturer in Philosophy at the University of Liverpool, and Jonathan Ray, Visiting Professor at Roehampton University and at the Royal College of Art. Jonathan Ray, as a young man at the University of Copenhagen, Kierkegaard was a devotee of Socrates. What did he admire about Socrates? He, he was a student, I think, for about ten years in the 1830s in, in, um, in Copenhagen University, student of philosophy, and he would have been taught about the history of philosophy as a huge narrative that begins, really, with Socrates. Socrates is the father of philosophy. Socrates is the first person who tried to use logical argument as a route to truth. And then the idea was that once that had been started in, you know, in 5th century BC Athens, it was carried forward by Plato and Aristotle, and it grew into a great... A, you know, massive oak tree of of metaphysics that flourished, perhaps over flourished in the Middle Ages, and then it was pruned by Descartes, the father of modern philosophy, and then it gradually developed again and it blossomed in the work of Hegel. Hegel, who provided out of the clues that had um, existed, been scattered around the previous history of philosophy, he provided a complete system, a theory of everything. Now, Hegel died in 1831, the very year that, um, that Kierkegaard began his studies at, at Copenhagen University, and Kierkegaard slowly began to become convinced that this whole story was a mistake and that the idea that Hegel was the truest disciple of the Socratic tradition was a lie. In truth, Hegel's ambition to crea create a whole system of philosophy was something that Socrates would have laughed at like a drain because the Socrates' secret, according to Kierkegaard, was that Socrates reckoned everyone was a fool and he was the biggest fool of all. The difference was that he knew it uh, and he thought that the task of philosophy was not to build up a system of knowledge but to take down our pretensions to know more than we really do. Would it be correct, Jonathan, to say that one of the attractions that Socrates had for Kierkegaard was he that he, according to Kierkegaard, Socrates did not propose one correct point of view of the world? Exactly. The byword for Socrates is irony. Socrates was the paradigm of an ironist. That means not just that he's a joker, it does mean that, but it means that he's someone who engages in conversation not in order to express the truths which he takes himself to be in possession of, but in what he goes with the ebb and he th thinks that truth happens in the ebb and flow of conversation, of engagements with other people. And you can't, you, the idea was that you could never tell from what Socrates said what Socrates really thought, because all he was interested in doing was teasing out, well, particularly teasing out the inconsistencies in what his interlocutors were saying. That's what's meant by saying he's an ironist. And that's exactly what Kierkegaard took from him, because Kierkegaard then developed a theory um, the theory of indirect communication, which said that with regard to the truths that are most important to us, they're not the kinds of things that can be transferred from one mind to another. You may be able to provoke someone into discovering those truths. In fact, Kierkegaard said you may be able to seduce someone or deceive someone into the truth. I suppose you could say he wanted to be the Socrates for the 19th century. Socrates famously never wrote anything down, but he just there are all these stories of what he said... Kierkegaard wrote enormously, but he wrote, in, he wrote under many different pseudonyms, he wrote in different styles, he wrote in different genres, so that one of the great things about Kierkegaard <coughs> is that you can never be quite sure what, whether what you read in his books is what Kierkegaard meant or whether it's some kind of stunt that he's performing in order to try and kind of rearrange the furniture inside his readers' heads. Claire Carlyle, can we turn to Hegel then? If Socrates was his hero, this is a bit of a simplification, but not, not too much, perhaps. Hegel was his villain. Now, Jonathan said something about that already. Can we develop that? What had Hegel done to earn Kierkegaard's ire? 
Well, yes, as Jonathan says, Hegel is the epitome of a, a systematic philosopher. That's to say, he wants to construct a self-grounding and all-encompassing totality of thought that incorporates nature, history, religion, art, and, of course, the human being within that totality. And for Kierkegaard, he did accept that man is a part of nature, a part of history, um, a part of society to some extent. But he also thought that the human being has an inner life, inwardness, as he calls it, that is separate from this outside world and that can't be assimilated into a system, that can't be rationalised, that can't even perhaps be articulated. And it's that inward sphere that Kierkegaard thinks Hegel's philosophy doesn't do justice to. Kierkegaard had been brought up by a Lutheran father. He was... He was a Christian, but he was very strongly against, as it were, the Christian state church, particularly the Danish Christian state church. And as I understand it, he thought that it was soporific and it missed the point. It was nothing to do with being a real Christian in understanding what was going on. What do you think? Kierkegaard made a distinction between Christianity and Christendom. And Christendom is the sort of social, institutionalised religious state, whereas Christianity is to do with the inner life of the individual and that individual's relationship to God. And Kierkegaard said that basically to be a Christian is to have faith, i.e. to live one's life with a certain relationship to God. And he identified a complacency in Denmark. Precisely because Christianity had become so institutionalised, Kierkegaard thought that everybody just assumed that they were automatically Christians just because they'd been born into this Christian country, because they'd been baptised, because perhaps they went to church, um, you know, every Sunday, and that that's what it meant to be a Christian. Um, and it's that complacency that Kierkegaard wants to unsettle. And, and, and to say that having faith is something that lies beyond the sphere of reason. It's not something that can just sort of cleverly be grasped and then one has it. It's, it's much more of an, an existential task. John Lippitt, because of his stance on faith, let's call it a stance, although it's, it's slightly wrong, really, given that, that they did do the philosopher in many voices, um, Kierkegaard has been accused of irrationalism, um, going against reason as a basis of judgment. Would you like to explore this a bit? Do you think that's true? Yeah, well, I mean, the charge that's sometimes made is that he thinks reason is just completely uh, redundant, and that, that really isn't uh, his, his uh, position. What he's rejecting, though, I think, is not reason per se, uh, but reason conceived of uh, rather in the way that uh, Claire was saying in describing uh, Hegel as some kind of timeless, godlike faculty, reason with a capital R, uh, if you like. And instead, what he's emphasising is the actual reasoning possibilities of creatures like us, historically and temporally situated, finite, flesh-and-blood human beings who can't occupy anything other than a limited, uh, finite perspective. So it isn't that he thinks that reason is redundant. Rather, he's part of a long philosophical tradition that's trying to understand what the limits of human reason are. One final thing to say about that would be to say I think it's important to connect this with, uh, you know, there's a religious dimension to this explicitly in the sense that Kierkegaard's view of human reason, I think, is connected with his view of our creatureliness. So uh, our beliefs are always partial, provisional, defeasible. We always see through a glass darkly, as it were. To, to try to construct a philosophical system is to take up an objective standpoint, almost a God's eye kind of perspective on the whole. And Kierkegaard had thought that that's not a perspective that we as human beings are entitled to. You know, in a sense, it's a sinful self-assertion to try to occupy that godlike position. So on the one hand, there's a, there's a religious motivation for that critique, but there's also a philosophical motivation for it too. Namely that Kierkegaard thinks that we, each of us, are alive, we're living in the world, we're temporal beings, we're always in the process of becoming. And if we do philosophy, then we do so from a subjective perspective, from the perspective of what he calls the existing individual. And from this perspective of the existing individual, there are elements to our existence, elements to our life, that are unknown, that can't be rationalised. So, for example, we live our lives forwards, and Kierkegaard famously said we, we can only understand them backwards, so we live our lives forwards towards the future, and that future is something that's unknown. And also, we live our lives in relationship to God. God is something that's unknown. So for Kierkegaard, there's an unknown, unknowable, 
unrationalizable dimension to human existence that can't be reduced to some kind of systematic explanation. John Lippitt, can I ask you before we move into more general discussion, uh, when he was 22, uh, he, he wrote, what I really need to be clear about is what I'm to do, not what I must know. Can you fit that in? Well, I think to understand that, that uh, journal entry, Kiko, you know, famously a keeper of uh, voluminous journals, we need to understand one or two of the other ideas that, that, that are in there. He talks about the need to find a truth which is true for me, the idea for which I'm willing to live and die. Now, the contrast there between action and knowledge uh, is, in one sense, slightly misleading. He does recognise, in that very same journal entry, uh, an, an imperative of knowledge. So it isn't that knowledge doesn't matter, but he says it must be taken up alive in me. So we've got here introduced very early on this important idea of uh, truth as uh, subjectivity. Uh, which is, um, again, a slightly misleading phrase. It isn't the rejection of objective truth. It's not relativism. It's not uh, subjectivism. Rather, it's an insistence uh, on placing this concrete, finite human subject at the centre of inquiry. Can I go to Jonathan Ray here? Um, the, there are no universal ac- uh, answers, as, as you said in your opening remarks, no final goal. No. But if truth is an objective, where does, to take up what John, John Rupert was saying, where does Kierkegaard think truth is to be found? Well, in a way, he thinks it's going to be, to be found in Jesus Christ. That's the, sh- the short answer, but not in the way that most Christians think that. I, he was very preoccupied by <clears throat> a problem that was sort of buried in the... In, 2,000 years of of Christianity about the relationship between classical pagan philosophy, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle, and and the true, you know, the Christian tradition that was written in Aramaic and and, and Hebrew. And his idea, and it's true that both Socrates and Jesus were heroes to him, but he thought they pulled in different directions. Socrates thought there was such a thing as truth and that it, it's just that we couldn't get hold of it, um, and that truth existed eternally and pre-existed us. That's to say he thought that the task of learning was actually a matter of recollecting. The, the really important truths are things that, that we knew in a former life, or that we originally knew, or that nature would teach us. Kierkegaard says you can't be a Christian and buy any of that, because if you're a Christian, you think that at a particular date, a new truth came into history, that, that Christianity is historical in a way that pagan philosophy is not, that a truth became possible that, that had never existed before. And that's why there's a rather confusing set of discussions that Kierkegaard has about the idea of repetition, about truth is something that is to be repeated. And I think the key to that is he's saying it's the opposite of recollection. Truth is something that goes towards the future. It goes towards something that's open. And there are truths that existed thanks to Jesus Christ, which, never, which didn't exist in the world before him. And that was a thought that pagan philosophy couldn't have. It's not a denial of truth, but it's an idea that truth is historical rather than eternal. How does this play to the idea of subjectivity, though, Jonathan? I, I find the... Um, I mean, there is this slogan of, of Kierkegaard's, which says something like, truth is inwardness, truth is subject, subjectivity, in some of the books from the middle 1840s. But as I understand it, I mean, maybe I'm rather too at the literary end of the interpretations of, of, of Kierkegaard. As I understand it, he's saying, if there was a truth that could be directly communicated, then it would be that truth, at least truth in regard to the really important matters, is subjective and inward. But, of course, that can't be communicated, and that's why we have to use all these roundabout storytelling, lyrical, dialectical methods, rather than than simply say... So the phrase, truth is subjective, expresses a truth that can't be expressed. In other words, by putting it like that, you're deforming it. Yes, I mean, I think just, just just to add to that, Kierkegaard somewhere says that the distinction between objective truth and subjective truth can be understood as a distinction between what and how. So objective truth is a matter of what is known or what is believed. Subjective truth is a matter of how one appropriates that truth, or in other words, how one lives. So Kierkegaard thinks that we, we, can, we can live truthfully or we can live untruthfully, and to live untruthfully involves self-deception hence the Socratic methods to try to um, illuminate that self-deception, or we can live truthfully. Um, And that's, I think, what he means by saying that subjectivity is truth. Can I turn to you, John Levitt? Um, Kierkegaard had a vision of 
or an idea of three stages in life, the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. Um, let's start with the aesthetic. Um, what is it to live an aesthetic life? Can you briefly tell us that? OK, well, the aesthetic uh, emerges uh, first and perhaps most clearly in a book called uh, Either Or, which is a particularly good example of the many voices that Jonathan was uh, alluding to kind of earlier. Um, the book is divided basically into two parts. There's this story about the paper, sets of papers having been found in a secret drawer of a desk. Things are always being found in unusual mm. places in Kierkegaard, in one case, at the, a locked box at it the bottom of a lake. Games, yeah. yeah. These seem to be papers which represent uh, two different life views, the aesthetic uh, and the ethical. And in the first, the, the aesthetic papers are... The papers seem to be the papers of an unnamed young man who's known uh, only as A, that represents uh, a state of extreme ennui and boredom with life. In one of the, pa the, the uh, essays... It's the fashion of the times, called, uh, we must remember, is that living at a time of high romanticism... Precisely so, and that's, yeah. a, that's a big influence, yeah. influence on this. What did he mean by... Which might be useful to go to the word aesthetic, because he didn't mean what, it, what it's now become, really. We're we talking about a different interpretation of the word, aren't we? To understand that, we need to understand a little bit about the tradition of German aesthetics, uh, Kant and so on, which talks about the aesthetic attitude as being one of essentially disinterest. Uh, so what the aesthete, the character of the aesthete is trying to do is to bring this uh, disinterested, disengaged, contemplative kind of attitude to life as a whole. And the result is that people become like pieces to be moved around on his chessboard, manipulated. But he's not prepared to engage with anything. He's not prepared to throw himself into existence, as it were. The aesthetic person is really one who organises his life around the principle of pleasure. He just wants... He's a, he's a hedonist in a sense. But the irony of the aesthetic way of life is it's actually, it's, it's sort of self-defeating. It leads to despair, not just a kind of melancholy, but more profoundly um, what Kierkegaard means by despair is the loss of oneself or the failure to be or to become oneself. So the young man sort of like sets himself the idea that the, the most important thing is to, to avoid boredom. And in order to do this, he says, well, one needs to avoid the things that might inspire boredom, such as commitments. So he advises avoid marriage, avoid friendship, avoid kind of a useful career. The, the, uh, the ethical character, Judge William, will try to persuade him that uh, this, is what, uh, this is precisely what is of value in life. Would you like to add to that, uh, Claire? K Kierkegaard thinks that the aesthetic sphere is what you end up with if you try to live in accordance with Hegelian principles. Um, so in a sense, part of his critique of Hegel is to say that doing philosophy, thinking abstractly, trying to take up an objective standpoint, is to actually, from an existential point of view, just, be, just to be confined to this aesthetic sphere which Kierkegaard thinks is the lowest of the different kinds of existence. That he, that he outlines. Why, Jonathan, does he think it's the lowest? Well, I'm not sure that he does exactly think it's the lowest. That's to say, I'm not sure that he's got such a clear sense of there being three different phases, aesthetic, ethical and, up and my, religious. My, my questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, I'm one of the, because to think of it like that is, is to put it in a kind of objectivising yeah. kind of way already. So that, uh, and one of the great things about either or, I mean, it looks as though it's presented, and John was making this point, it looks as though it's, it's two, two sets of papers and the editor says, well, you know, they're, they're written on different kinds of paper. Then, actually, the papers contain transcripts of some of the stuff by other people, and then the editor says, actually, I don't think they're by two different people at all. I think they're all by the same person. Mm -hmm. And so you end up thinking, actually, it's not, it's not as though there's a choice between different ways of going about There's a wonderful... The only bit that's actually called either or in the book either or, is a little discussion, I think it's in the aesthetic bit, where the, where the guy, guy says, either or, marry, you'll regret it, don't marry, you'll regret it, laugh with the followers of the world or weep over them, you'll regret it either way, hang yourself or don't hang yourself, you'll regret it either way. It goes, so, that, in fact, it's not as though he's saying you have to make the right choice. You have to be aware that there are choices to be made, but the most important thing is that you have to realise that your interests are vitally at stake in what you think, and the important thing is not so much what opinions you have, but how you live those opinions. Right. The, I got the impression, and just be emphatic if I'm completely wrong, I don't mind, um, that there was a hierarchy, that, you, that the aesthetic was... It, it was a sort of three-tier view, that the aesthetic was youthful 
and and in the end inadequate and you move to the ethical um, and you move kind of up or along or you improved or matured or we can keep going on with those is that completely wrong John Lippitt if not can you talk about the ethical and we can do the rest of the programme <laughs> OK, uh, I think um, this is where the many voices becomes kind of important. In someone like the pseudonym uh, Johannes Climacus, for example, I think it is quite clear that there is a hierarchy of stages, and he uses this imagery of height all the time mm. and sort of like ascending, uh, ascending at the various stages. But I think what, what I agree with about what Jonathan was uh, suggesting is that... Um, It isn't like when you move on to the ethical stage, you leave behind the aesthetic stage altogether. There's the form. Well, let's nail this a little bit more. Sorry to interrupt, and and, and, and obviously I'm a complete amateur here, but still. Judge William, who's also in this discussion with A, he's the older person, does say what you're doing will not be a satisfying life. Does say marriage might require a sacrifice, but if you stay with it, the sacrifice will be well worth it, and mm. so on. So there is a distinction, there is a different attitude to life. And one of the things that fascinates... I mean, I think Kierkegaard was the, was the philosopher of choice for people who didn't read philosophy because he talked so much about, about these, the things that interest you at that stage. But there is a difference there, isn't there? Right. Um, that, that, that's right. But in the case of uh, Judge William, one of his two long letters to A is... Uh, called this, well, named by the editor, The Aesthetic Validity of Marriage. And part of the technique there is not to say, oi, young man, you've got, all this, you've got all this completely wrong. In general, the tactic, the communication tactic, seems to be to try to persuade A that what he truly values... That's the boy, is it? The young A man, is the, yeah. the young man, the aesthetic yeah. guy. Uh, what he truly values, he will get in a sort of, in a transfigured form uh, if he moves on to the ethical. So, for example... Uh, A, he thinks, uh, you mentioned romanticism uh, earlier. A is um, Never besotted with a woman by. More than six months, is that, pre- isn't he? Yeah. Precisely. Yes. And he's besotted by the idea of first love, butterflies in the stomach, uh, yes. uh, and all that. What the judge he tries to do is. To perpetually recurring first love. <laughs> Precisely, yes. precisely. What the judge tries to, to, to do is to say, look, you claim the, the, the kind of beauty that you claim to see in first love. You, you sort of, marital love gives you this squared. So it's an attempt to try to, to persuade A that what you're really valuing, you can get by this kind of move rather than just preaching at him directly. Can we enter into this, uh, Claire, from your view of is there a sense of... Um a movement from the aesthetic. I, uh, Jonathan has, has quite correctly uh, fudged it and confused <laughs> it, and, and that's, that's, that's the Kierkegaard, that's fine. But I, I would like to see if we can also make distinctions, and I think distinctions have begun to be made. Can, will you develop, or, or not, what John Lippert has just said? Yes, I mean, I think one, one way of looking at this theory of the spheres or stages is precisely as an aid to self-reflection. So Kierkegaard thinks that people you know, deceive themselves, they don't really know where they stand, they just assume that they're Christians. Um, and what Kierkegaard does in his text is presents um, characters who are living different kinds of life, and that invites the reader to identify him or herself with one of these characters. So, for example, what Kierkegaard is saying is that you can live what, from the outside, seems to be a Christian life, but actually um, you're living in a purely aesthetic way. And then the ethical sphere has a different organising principle, and that is the principle of living a moral life and um, having duties and responsibilities and so on. And Kierkegaard says that ultimately that is self-defeating too. That's also going to lead to despair because the human condition is such that the ideal moral life is not attainable. You know, we could say because we're finite creatures, because we're not perfect, or, as Kierkegaard would say, because we are all sinners. And so... The ethical ends in despair too because we're not able to live up to the moral standards that are required and that's where the move to the religious sphere comes. So the distinction between the ethical sphere and the religious sphere is the individual's realisation that he's not sufficient to attain the ideal by himself and that he needs to turn to God, he needs to open himself up to divine grace, he needs some kind of help and that's where the transition from the ethical sphere to the religious sphere takes place. John and Ray, that takes place mostly I think in, in well anyway it certainly takes place in, the, in his book Fear and Trembling where he uses the story of Abraham's um, decision to obey the injunction to 
sacrifice his son, Isaac, uh, to, as it were, move from the aesthetic to the ethical. I've long since talked about moving up or over, but he'll move into the religious sphere. Can you tell us about what he meant by that and why that was an extremely pertinent story to tell in this, uh, in this instance? Well, I think the thing about the story of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his, his only son, Isaac, is that by any ordinary moral or indeed aesthetic standards, it's a completely outrageous thing to do. You know, the father of these of the, of the faiths turns out to be a child murderer or, you know, willing to be a child murderer. And he did it just because God told him to. And a lot of... And in a generation before Kierkegaard, Kant had said this was absolutely immoral. If, 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 if Abraham seriously wanted to... seriously intended to carry out God's injunction, then that was immoral of him. He should have told God what you're demanding is impossible. And Kierkegaard's saying, actually, there's something much more interesting here. And I, I love the way he begins this book, Fear and Trembling. Fear and Trembling, subtitled A Dialectical Lyric, which is to say a kind of logical poem, a sort of contradiction in terms. It's a generic um, it's, it's a generic nothing, this book. It has this wonderful little section called Attunement, where it says, there once was a man... Hold on. <coughs> attunement. Right. Attunement. There once was a man, once upon there was a man, and as a child he'd read the wonderful story about Abraham and Isaac, and as he grew older, he kept going back to it, and the more he thought about it, the more he loved this story, and the more he was fascinated by it and the less he could understand it. And the idea is that somehow the old man who recognised that he couldn't, there was something about Abraham's faith he couldn't understand was wiser than the philosopher Kant who said Abraham's faith was immoral because there was it was just an acknowledgement that there is something about leading a, a good life that we're never going to be able to pin down and, and reason about. And that's what, in, what is involved in faith. But yet as I understand it, Kierkegaard didn't necessarily think it was leading a good life. He said if a, if, a, if a man in a church, even in a Danish church at the time, had stood up and said, um, I will now go and kill my son for God, the congregation would have lynched him, or at least Absolutely. prevented him. Absolutely, yes. and, and I mean, the thing, the thing about being, being a Christian... Well, and there's a very useful phrase that Kierkegaard uses, which is becoming a Christian. Um, and you might think, at first sight, the idea of becoming a Christian, you might think, well, it, it means, you know, you, you grow out of being an aesthete, you grow out of being an ethicist, and you become a person of, of faith. That's not really what Kierkegaard means by becoming a Christian. His idea is that the very idea of being a Christian is contradictory, because to be a Christian would to be to think of Christianity as a doctrine that you could relax into like a comfortable armchair. But the whole point about being a Christian is that you always have to be on your guard against relapsing into taking things for granted. Clark Carlyle, uh, where do you, how do you interpret... Jonathan's given us a, a, a very good outline of, of the, of the uh, Abraham and Isaac story. And Kierkegaard, one of the one of the many things he does is to seek out what it is to be a real Christian, just like he seeks out what it is to lead a truthful life. And so, he doesn't. He doesn't seem to. Fi- he doesn't seem to find or want to find any certainty, does he? Well, no. I mean, I think there's a there's a question that's that's raised in fear and trembling. Uh, you know, in fear and trembling, Abraham is presented as the father of faith. And Kierkegaard says that, you know, normally um, Christians are very complacent about this. We admire Abraham because he's someone who has faith. But in fact, um, when we reflect on the story of Abraham, we can't understand it. Can we really imagine ourselves doing what Abraham did? And so the question is raised here, is it really possible to have faith? just as Socrates wanted to disrupt people's assumptions that they already possess knowledge by saying, actually, I don't know anything. Do you really know something? So Kierkegaard wanted to unsettle people's assumptions that they were already Christians by saying, or by using his pseudonyms to say, actually, I'm not a Christian. I don't know if I do have faith. I don't know if I can have faith. Is it even possible? Because in the case of Abraham, Having faith involves believing something that's completely paradoxical and contradictory. Um, and Abraham has faith because he is willing to sort of hold that contradiction and to live his life and to live his relationship to God, not just in spite of this contradiction, but in full light of this contradiction. And what Abraham achieves in the end is to receive Isaac back. He, he's prepared to give him up. He goes through this, this movement of resignation, as Kierkegaard describes it. And then God changes his mind. Abraham receives Isaac back. Um, and so, in a sense, one always has to give up oneself or give up what is most precious to one in order to be able to receive it back as a gift from God. And it's that receptivity that is the essence of faith. It's not something that we do. It's something that we that we receive. There's this 
theme that comes up in Kierkegaard in a number of different ways and in a number of different voices of giving something back and giving something up and getting it back in some kind of heightened or transfigured kind of form. Well, let's move on a, a little bit because he wrote about so many different subjects and, and, and um, let's take uh, his ideas on love. Uh, John Lippitt, can you give us an introduction to this? OK, there's a, there's a lovely line uh, in the journals where he says, fit, we've just been talking about fear and trembling. He said, actually, fear and trembling is not the prime mover of the Christian life, for this is love. And I think he's... So love is a theme that runs throughout the, the so-called aesthetic writings, like either or that we've been talking about, seduction versus married love in the case of the aesthetic versus the ethical. But I think Kierkegaard's ma mature ethical and religious thought on love is found in an 1847 book called Works of Love, where what he's doing, and this... He's writing under his own name, so this is not pseudonymous. He unpacks some of the key New Testament passages on love. Uh, so, for example, you shall love your neighbour, which he divides up into three different parts. You shall love the neighbour. You shall love the neighbour. It's commanded. It's a duty. And you shall love the neighbour. So, you know, exactly who is the neighbour as opposed to someone that you're inclined towards or have some kind of uh, friendship with uh, or, or, or whatever. And there's several themes that emerge from this. One is the sheer demandingness uh, of Christian love. He has this notion of love as being a duty, and he emphasises the Christian in Junction that kind of like your neighbour includes your enemy, and just the sheer the sheer difficulty of this, and yet it's commanded. Uh, another is a worry about uh, preferential love, like he's forever contrasting uh, Christian love, agape, uh, with uh, erotic love and friendship. Um, and the main point that he seems to be making there is that preference or inclination can't be the basis of responsibility for the other person. Can I just bring Jonathan in here on this? It's also love your neighbour as yourself. I mean, a lot of people don't particularly love themselves, so they give themselves a hard time. They might want to give their neighbours a hard time. I mean, I this is... I, 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 it sounds horribly flippant, but I don't apologise for it. It gets us to the next stage. But well, I, I think I think it's a really important point. And I say, I, I, as, as a kind of morose 21st century secularist, I find myself a bit surprised sometimes at finding no one more interesting about these kinds of issues than the, the great Christian um, Kierkegaard. Sometimes, you know, there's this old Christian thing about how the devil has the best tunes. I think we secularists now have to think that actually maybe the Christians have the best tunes, certainly as regards love. Well, in Works of Love, I th and it's a very complex book, but the main thing I take from it is the idea that when you say you should love people, love others as you, as you love yourself, the usual way to hear that is to say, exactly as you were suggesting, that there's no problem, we have no problem loving ourselves. And then the question is, how do we kind of uh, lend a bit of our self-love to other people, to include them in, in our kind of favouritism towards ourselves? And Kierkegaard's point is that it's not like that at all, and that the and that the Christian teaching about loving others as yourself is also a teaching about, if you like, loving yourself as another. And about it's a question about how, <clears throat> what it is to relate, what your duty is to yourself as well as what your duty is to others. John, yes. He makes a distinction, which I think is important uh, in, in connection with what Jonathan's just been saying, between uh, proper self-love and selfish self-love. So the real challenge is what is it to love oneself properly as opposed to selfishly? And what distinction does he make, then? Well, this is actually kind of quite hard to, to pin down exactly what kind of proper self-love is actually uh, uh, concerned with. I mean, one, one thing that I would say is that in connection also with what he says about erotic love uh, and friendship, uh, he says the friend, the spouse, is first and foremost uh, the neighbour. So you have this important kind of notion that God is the middle term, he says. So both the friend, the spouse, and also the self need to be loved in a sense through God, that God is the, the kind of invisible third in these various kind of love, love relationships. So proper self-love would need to incorporate that. Jonathan Wright, uh, given uh, Kierkegaard's religious um, religion and what he was trying to do, it's, it's rather surprising that he is known as the father of existentialism, uh, it's a philosophy that presumes the absence of God, and yet, uh, and it was, let's say, it wasn't, the phrase wasn't around in his day, the German philosopher Jaspers, as I understand it, coined it in about 1920. How did Jaspers carry Kierkegaard into existentialism? 
Well, I'm not sure you're right about, in the presumption that existentialism and, and, and Christianity are incompatible. And I think a lot of the 20th century existentialists were, were Christians as well. So existentialism is a, is a, is, is a house with, ma- with many rooms. I'm not sure about Jasper. It's rather difficult to make out where he stood about religion. But it's, what's definitely true is that, I mean, you, you can't really object to Kierkegaard being classified as an existentialist, although it's true that existence philosophy is a term that wasn't invented till 1919, 1920. It and existentialism didn't get into the English language until the 1940s, I, th- I, I think. But Kierkegaard did talk about existence as being the particular quality of the of the being of the individual subject, as opposed to the being of other things. And and Jaspers called existence philosophy after Kierkegaard. So I mean, in a way, it, existence philosophy is a is, is his name for for Kierkegaard, Kierkegaardianism. And you think of I think you're probably thinking of Sartre as the paradigmatic existentialist. He was an atheist, but he paid enormous tribute to Kierkegaard. He you know there's this phrase of Kierkegaard about how the problem for the Christian is becoming a Christian, that you could, it's something you can never settle, settle into. The, for the centenary of, um, of Kierkegaard's death in, in 1955, Sartre gave a lecture saying, well, for us atheists, the problem is becoming an atheist, that it's as difficult to, for atheists to be atheists as, as Kierkegaard recognised it was difficult for Christians to be Christians as well. Claire Carla, would you like to develop this idea of becoming uh, which which seems to pertain to what Kierkegaard says about being a Christian and about existentialism too. Yes, that's right. I mean, Kierkegaard in fact says that um, not only is um, is Christianity a matter of becoming a Christian, but he also says that to exist is to be continually in a process of becoming. So in a sense, it's a, that's that's what it is to be human, is to be a thoroughly temporal, finite creature who lives towards the future, and. To make that claim involves a critique of systematic philosophy. And we can see both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche as two 19th century thinkers who criticise idealism, criticise systematic philosophy in the name of becoming, in the name of life as it's lived from the perspective of the existing individual. And those two critiques, very different critiques, of course, Kierkegaard's and Nietzsche's philosophies are in many ways very different, but these two critiques, both very polemical, are then taken up in the 20th century by philosophers like Martin Heidegger and, of course, Sartre, and given, give, given more sort of flesh, in a sense, um, and in a sense... With both Heidegger's book being in time and Sartre's book being in nothingness, there's almost an attempt to systematise this idea of becoming, to try to articulate an account of what it is to be an existing individual, whereas we just get sort of flashes of this in Kierkegaard's and Nietzsche's writings, but these ideas are taken up and developed and worked out much more coherently, in a sense, in the 20th century existentialists. The other great um, 20th century sort of existentialist who learned from Kierkegaard is, of course, W.H. Auden, who did regard himself as something of an existentialist. And it was through Kierkegaard, it was through when Kierkegaard started being translated into English in the late 1930s, Auden absorbed it and he said it knocked me completely sideways. Uh, and he became a, a, a Kierkegaard lover. And I think that he... Um, there were things about Auden's Christianity that owed a great deal to um, to Kierkegaard, and also about Auden's Auden's sense of the of the kind of sadness of people who are excessively logical was something that he that he took from from Kierkegaard. How significant, all of you, to pinch? How significant do you think his work is now in philosophy and in the general run? Um, and Jonathan has indicated that he, through Auden and through a great number of others, he uh, he he influenced or was certainly. Um, uh, much enjoyed uh, by uh, certain by, by writers, uh, by many creative writers, and so on. Uh, where, where where is he placed now? What's what's the view of him? Can we start with you, John? Uh, well, I think uh, Claire's already connected Kierkegaard with Nietzsche, and I think one thing that they have in common is the sheer range of different philosophical. Uh, positions that have like tried to claim both Nietzsche and Kierkegaard for their their, their own. I think he kind of straddles, in a sense, the the, the often made analytic uh, continental kind of uh, distinction. And I think one way in which he is being... uh, We've been talking mostly about existentialism, but one way in which 
a more kind of like uh, traditional kind of uh, Anglo-American philosopher might uh, locate him is in terms of his contribution to the virtues. There's been a lot of work recently on kind of virtue ethics and the significance of the virtues. And I think from Kierkegaard is one source that we could draw on for an understanding of maybe specifically theological virtues like faith, hope and love and so on. And there's, there's quite a bit of work being done on drawing on that aspect of Kierkegaard at the moment. Like Allah. Kierkegaard's a, a bottomless pit, really. Um, you know, his 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 philosophy is so rich and so complex that the, there is a there's a there's a wealth of resources there. Um, you know, in, in various different philosophical traditions that we find ourselves with, because Kierkegaard has these theological categories that he that he operates with, people often would be reluctant to see the connection between him and more secular philosophers. For example, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, I think, is um, very much indebted to Kierkegaard in a way that's perhaps not recognised. With someone, someone like Derrida, who's, who's emphasising the fact that ideals are not necessarily possible, there's an aspect of human existence or there's an aspect of language that always undermines itself, that there's never any, there's never any sort of closure on concepts, on theses and so on that that kind of very modern idea is one that we can trace back to Kierkegaard and to Kierkegaard's imaginative reinterpretation of Socrates. Jonathan finally. I guess um, philosophy in our time is is a heavily professionalized industry um, in a way that Kierkegaard would have would have loathed. I mean, he hated professors. He said, "Take it. What's the difference between a thinker and a professor? Take away the paradox, and you have a professor." Uh, it's, a, it's a term he used, and, and it seems to me that he would see, he would think that contemporary philosophy is dominated by the professors. And I think that contemporary philosophy would be in a much better condition if it would allow itself to learn more from Kierkegaard. There's a wonderful phrase he had in in his notebooks about you know, even if you offered me a place in the great edifice of the system, I would rather be the kind of thinker who just sits on a branch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, John Lippett, Claire Carlyle and Jonathan Ray. And next week on In Our Time, I'll be discussing Henry VIII and the dissolution of the monasteries. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.